And welcome again, everyone, to today's webinar. I am pleased to introduce uh, CTY's Executive Director, Amy Shelton, who will be talking to us today about her recent research on keeping advanced learners engaged through novelty. Amy, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stacy, and, and welcome everyone. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where exactly you are right now. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this because as Stacy mentioned, I'm the current executive director here at, at CTY, but I also wear a couple different hats, including being a professor of education and um, at my heart, a researcher. And I still do spend a, a very tiny portion of my time in the research space and I get to do very exciting projects, including the one I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. Um, which is regarding um, the notion of novelty and um, why it's essential to keeping advanced learners engaged. And so this is work that we've been doing for a couple of years. Um, and I'm excited to kind of, I'm gonna share some snippets and then kind of the, the aspects of it that bring it into how we might put it into practice. Um, before I actually jump into the research though, no research is done alone. Um, and though she can't be here with me to present, I wanted to definitely acknowledge my collaborator, friend, and colleague, uh, Solby Young, who, who did this work as part of her um, postdoctoral fellowship uh, here at CTY and School of Education. Um, she's also a visiting scholar now and remains a close colleague and an, an important collaborator in our space. So I wanted to be clear that the work I'm going to talk about, um, she's at the heart of a lot of it um, and, and is still, we have ongoing work in this space. So as I noted, I'm going to talk a little bit about engagement and uh, novelty and some other aspects of it as well. And to do that, I want to kind of give you the mindset that we come from. And a lot of this has to do with thinking long term about what we want in a space. So when we're talking about advanced learners. We're talking about students in the CTY space. And we really do have to think about what our goals are for our students. And one of the framings we often talk about is um, how engagement can be entangled in, in aspects of what we think a student needs. And there's this whole list of what we call myths of academic success. Um, and I'd like to just talk briefly about two of those because I think they set, they set the stage for why we talk about this, this other aspect, which is engagement. And the two that, that we're seeing very prominently right now in particular um, out in the education field, largely among parents, but also among many educators, uh, is that um, that it's all about grades and test scores. And so I'm a parent of a, of a child who's about to go to college. So I do know that the grades and test scores are important and I don't mean to suggest that they are not. Um, but I do think when we talk about what our goals are for a student, it's not helpful to think about grades and test scores. Uh, that's sort of a byproduct in many ways. And the second is that there's this sort of mysterious checklist of must have activities that every student must do. Like I heard someone recently say, every student should, going to college should have a science internship and every student who should have this many AP classes. And really that's sort of counter to um, a lot of what we actually see in terms of what is what, what predicts student success and what predicts um, this other piece, which is uh, engagement. And what we have to think about is this notion of engagement and what it really means. And it turns out that being engaged in your learning is probably one of the best predictors of success. It also includes the engagement of um, those around you and your support group, but really it's keeping a student engaged. And in my view, really a lifelong learner, like creating a lifelong learner who's engaged. And we think of this as sort of finding passions and fostering curiosity, but those are pretty nebulous. And, and the question has always been, well, how, how do you keep someone engaged and, and how can we really sort of put some concrete language around the things that we can do? And as someone who works you know, for an out of school program, we are a supplement to, to school as, all, as many of you know. And so we kind of have the freedom to talk a little bit more about um, how we might engage our students and what different tools and, and uh, tricks we might use to do that. And the project that I wanna tell you just a little bit about is this uh, aspect of trying to get the student voice on what's engaging. Now, if we were in a big auditorium, I would ask you all right now to raise your hand if you've ever been asked to do a survey after you've done a course or a program or a webinar. Um, we get asked to do these satisfaction surveys on things all the time. And some of you might wonder if you're not in that area, 
what actually happens to those? And what I'll tell you is what happens is we take them and we look at them very closely and we pull out of it lessons learned. And sometimes those lessons learned are so valuable that instead of using them solely to improve what we do, we actually pull those messages out and share them back with the world. And that's what this is really about. So this is some work where we took uh, student, student satisfaction data, um, a very robust student satisfaction survey uh, in an, a summer out of school program. In this case, um, much of the data are from CTY Greece. So I'm gonna show you a little from a broader set as well, but very much the CTY kind of coursework. And uh, on those surveys, those who are familiar with, with ours may know this already, we ask you to do quantitative ratings on satisfaction uh, and it's satisfaction with as well as engagement in the various activities that you do during these programs. Uh, we also collect qualitative responses on what the lived experience is like for a student. And in this study, we did something a little different by trying to use those two things together to better understand what our students were saying and ask these really critical questions about what were the themes that emerged in terms of what caused a student to feel good about the program and engaged in the program, satisfied with the program? And then did those factors vary at all uh, based on whether a course was more or less engaging? And that's a really important part of this aspect because when we looked at the literature on what keeps a student engaged, it's really interesting. People try things and then they look to see how student outcomes change. And as a result, they say, well, this engages students more because you get these outcomes. What we wanted to look at was where students are actually saying this was engaging. I'm very engaged in this. I'm very, and, and you know, different words can be put on the word engaged, but where they're signifying to us that they had an interest, it kept their attention, they enjoyed it, they had a good time, which we know from both the, um, the data on outcomes and on the neuroscience and on the cognitive science, that, that being invested, being emotionally moved, being sort of part of the action is what uh, facilitates learning and strengthens learning. So we wanted to look at the what students were saying, but what, what they were saying in the context of how engaged their courses were. So this is, I always love to do as a first pass on any data, I love to, to play with word clouds because they're kind of a quick way to get a first pass at what's going on. And this is actually a word cloud grabbed from um, a part of, of a related data set. Um, just to kind of show you that the, the things that stand out when a, when a student is asked, what did you like about the class? What was the most engaging part of the class? Um, and sometimes questions about instructors as well. And you see things, um, you know, here, some of the bigger words here are things like challenging, new, exciting, interesting. And we, of course, get think and learn. We also get things like critical thinking and uh, going deeper into material. Um, sometimes we get in these hard, um, which, which uh, hard and challenging are, are two we often see. But we actually took this uh, from a data perspective and uh, layered onto this uh, a qualitative analysis of, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into great details on the particulars of the, of the analysis, but we looked for these themes and organized them. So first I'm just gonna show you the research version of that organization, which is we took the student evaluation and looked at sort of the course features um, that, they, that, that we had asked about. We looked at positive themes and then improvement themes. And in each of those, we got lots of really interesting results. So we've actually been able to look at in other data sets as well and found things like um, that you had to have adequate challenge. Um, we talked about applicability of the knowledge. And then there was this category of novelty, which people have talked about a lot in this space. Now I'm gonna give you the version of this as sort of the um, take home message version of, of what you're seeing here, primarily on the positive themes, meaning what are the things that students are reporting as being engaging. And it comes down to a handful of things. One, particularly for advanced learners, it's rigorous material. Um, and and that falls right into the space of, we know a student is most engaged in general when they are sufficiently challenged. And it's it, for those of you who are not familiar, this is something we call a fancy term is zone of proximal development. It just means we've matched the challenge to the student or to the individual. And for advanced learners, that usually means uh, the risk is being under challenged. So it means rigorous material. We see that um, a lot of people point to a supportive peer environment. And this is interesting because it's, it, it transcends these programs we're talking about today, which are largely in person, but people also, when you can report that in other spaces, this seems to be a really important aspect. Um, and really the way to characterize is that the opportunity to meet 
a variety of other students who are intellectually, quote, like me, builds your self-concept. It validates the academic strengths as a positive. Um, it also provides insight into the fact that you may be similar academically, but still vary along lots of other dimensions. So it creates a really uh, strong sense of community. Um, another one we see is uh, evidence that what, what people are looking for is this fostering of passions. And in the motivation literature, uh, we know that your motivation for things can vary depending on the particular domain, topic, or area you're working in. And that's true for advanced learners as well. So uh, one of the things we do see is that finding and fostering passions, when, when a student feels that a course or a program or an event is doing that, you see that that, that increases their uh, sense of engagement. They point to that as a meaningful thing. And then, as I said before, there's this novelty. Um, and novelty generally means trying new things that can create a sense of sort of wonder. And that that is a very engaging feeling. Now, it's funny because this co contradicts some of what we talk about in sort of social and emotional spaces where we're really comfortable in our comfort zone. It's it's actually, it's, it's disconcerting to be out of your comfort zone. And so novelty is that kind of fine line because you're not really saying we need to push you out of your comfort zone entirely, but that a sense of novelty seems to matter. And I wanna talk a little bit more about this novelty because these were all themes that we saw across the board. And when we dug in and looked at the uh, spaces where students were more engaged or their, their strongest engagement. Um, so, so when we could pull out groups of students who had high engagement because of a particular course, because of a particular segment, what we saw was that novelty really stood out. Um, this seemed to be a really key factor. And so we dug in a little bit more to understand, so what is it? What, what do we mean when we say novelty in this context? And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about then how you might foster it as well. So what we actually found was that the novelty comes in two forms. The first form was the academic content form. So when we looked across the responses and what students were saying about their courses, we found that for many of them, they were pointing to the academic content as being material that they couldn't get anywhere else, material that's new. Um, so many of our courses are things like cryptology or number theory or things that are not your typical classes. And when the content itself was really novel to them, um, perhaps in a domain of familiarity, but novel versions of it, that seemed to be a key. And then the other was um, novelty in the pedagogical approach, which anyone who's had experience with C2I knows we're, we're always trying new and interesting ways to engage our students. And the way this was described, I love one student, it's, it's a new spin on learning. So it's having uh, the content there, but, but having it in a context that is, is, is uh, unique in the sense of the way it's being approached. So um, classic examples of this for us would be things that feel more college seminar style, um, facilitated learning situations where the, the instructor really is sort of a co-learner in the space with the student. That is unusual for a K-12 learner. And that seems to be something that not only do we know it's unusual, but the students really do pick that out. They talk about it being so different from their quote regular school. And so these two pieces, the academic content and the pedagogical approach can go hand in hand and often do. Many of the courses that we do at CTY really are both these things. But what was interesting was that the students really were, were, were very solid and resonating to, to one or both of these kinds of novelty. They really were quite distinct in the data. So this leads us to the conclusion that, that different students may resonate with different aspects of this. And that's useful in terms of ways we might improve our own, um, both our content and our approach, because we often do courses that you might find in a school, but if we can do it in a way that provides a really novel approach, we can get that engagement that sort of gives that extra boost. So for each of these, I just wanna uh, point out a little bit of um, sort of the features of what to consider. So when we talk about academic content being novel, um, the way we talk to this with a, would, to a parent would be, um, is this something my child can't or won't get in school? Is this a content area or a, a level of depth or a, a context that you won't find in a school? So when we do things like uh, teaching geometry by doing an early architecture class for second graders, that's not something a second grader is typically going to get exposed to in school. That's a very unique kind of um academic content, you know, learning to learning to build a playground is not necessarily a, a, a typical school, school topic. Um, does it expand an area that a child might be interested in? 
So if I have a student who's very interested in math, would something like game theory or number sense or any of those sort of um, number-based programs resonate with that particular child? So it, again, it's a content kind of novelty. And for most of our older students, this really comes down to offering courses that have the feel of either a sort of standard college course or even a unique kind of college course, so unique niche courses. And then the other question that you always ask when you're thinking about kids is, is this an area my child has not yet explored? Because one thing we, we know in the engagement space is it's not just, I like something already and I wanna go deeper. It's also often really helping them find it. And the content areas can really be a helpful way of doing that. The other form, which is the pedagogical approach is more about the way, so the way it's being presented. Um, and so, for, for us, this really led to questions like, well, who are the instructors? Who are we training and bringing into this space? And, and it, you know, at CTY, we, we take a lot of pride in who we've recruited as instructors over the years. And we really do think of them as our experts who can put sort of the, the added polish on our classes. Um, what is the philosophical approach, both of the program, the course, um, at whatever level we're talking about, because that's going to drive the kind of pedagogy that, that's being used. So we take a very strong um, view of facilitated learning and doing things in a project-based way, really putting the, the onus on the student to learn in a positive way. Um, and, and you can ask very practical questions like, will it be interactive? Will it be hands-on? These are the kinds of things that are harder to do in a school setting. And so all of this boils down to how much is it, quote, like my typical school? Now, I know there are many schools out there that take really inventive pedagogical approaches, um, but that, that probably adds to much of their student engagement and certainly teachers. There are many, many teachers who pull these tools in and use them effectively and are probably, those are the ones we probably think of as really being engaging for our students. So really is the case, you've got these kind of two forms of novelty. Um, so the last thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about, um, for those who might be parents or aunts and uncles or um, just interested or educators, um, we kind of have this, you can take this research and talk about kind of a quick guide to caregivers. Um, and the first step in finding opportunities for students is actually just knowing what's out there. And so we, we talk about sort of the, the, how do I go and find these unique experiences, these interesting pieces for a, for a student. And the first is just the power of search. And we say one thing that we do is empower our students. So for parents or caregivers who have older students, um, those students are often a great resource for finding out what's going on in the world. Probably our most favorite, our most popular one is talk to other parents, um, parents, you know, sharing their information. And as a parent myself, who also works in education, it's been fascinating kind of watch that, how that evolves and how the information gets passed. Um, obviously, there's a lot of online resources, there are activity fairs, there are local publications. There are lots of places to go to, to look for these experiences as well. Um, including schools and districts and, and um, like us, colleges and universities, um, various other locations where people run these kinds of programs. The second step, step then is vetting the opportunities. And this is where this sort of novelty starts to come in much more. Um, and opportunities can be broad. They don't all have to be academic. Um, we need to look at the lens of the sort of features of engagement. So for an advanced learner, we do see the emerging themes of the academic rigor, uh, the peer community, um, and then this novelty. And so really putting that kind of a lens on a program and asking what's there. Um, considering a child's current needs, and I, I actually, generally, I have a slide that I often use that, that distinguishes a child's needs from the parent or caregiver's wants. Um, and as a parent, you have to, you know, I, I know I've fought that many times over, having to resist the idea that, well, I think I know best. Um, so really looking at what a child needs and what a child needs right now because it will change. So you may have a child that has yet to find their passions. You may have a child who needs a break from the academics and maybe they need a break from the academics in the sense of the, the grading and the assessment, which makes an academic program in the summer potentially a great candidate. Others really do need something you know, separate from that. And so figuring out kind of is, what, what a child needs at any given moment. Is it more academics with less pressure? Is it sampling to find their passions? Is it really taking a break from, from some of these things? And finding the various versions of that. And then additional considerations are all kinds of things, like who are the students? I mean, one of the things we pride ourselves on at, at CTY is bringing together the right peer community that has diversity along all those dimensions that are not about the academic ability, but, but 
ties kids together along that, that uh, particular dimension. Um, we also know practical things like we always have to say, you know, families have schedules, the daily logistics of a program, whether or not a program is residential or a day. And in fact, there are, there, there are lovely checklists that, um, that people put together to say like, here's how you vet a program. What's missing to me from that checklist is this notion of those factors of engagement and particularly what's interesting and novel, what's gonna keep my child engaged. And then finally, this issue of choosing the opportunities. And again, I go back to this sort of going back to the question of needs, making sure that you think about the child's needs over, over perhaps what the educator or the parent or the guardian wants. Presenting the options to a child um, and engaging a child on what seems interesting or what types of new experiences the child might mo most want to try. So this is that intersection of, we know novelty is important, but you also need to get the child involved in it. And, and it, you know, it can't be too scary. I um, always say, you need to encourage your child out of their comfort zone a little bit, but make sure that that place you're encouraging them into still has something that interests them and engages them. And again, that's gonna depend on where a child is in their space. Or I wouldn't even say as an adult, as someone who likes to try new things, um, there are times when I want to kind of pursue the thing that I've been interested in and want to just enrich that. And other times, it's really time to try and explore something new and find a new passion. And then finally, encouraging a child to make the choice. Um, in, in this whole space of engagement, we sometimes lose the fact that as parents or educators or caregivers or you know the adults in a child's life, we make a lot of decisions for them. And alongside these other factors of engagement, we know that part of that gravitation to interesting and exciting things comes from a child actually being, being empowered to make those choices. So um, with that, I wanna just uh, share what I sort of view as like, let me just cobble together what I think are some sort of fun take home messages from this, this area that we've been working in. Um, and the first is the obvious, the, the strong conclusions around the fact that advanced learners are engaged by novelty. And this does seem to be distinct from some of the other engagement pieces because it really seems to be strongest when you start talking about um, examples of students who are heavily engaged, these are the things they point to. And, and again, two kinds of novelty, that of the content area and then the other is a pedagogical approach. And so in the ideal world, world, you can marry those two, but it does mean things like if you are talking about giving sort of standard academic content that a student might get in school, then having novelty in the approach is really uh, an essential piece then to bring out that novelty. Um, and then sort of other more, uh, the sort of broader aspects of this are that nurturing a lifelong love of learning, which is sort of at the heart of what we see in our students and our alumni and and those who are in the CTY sphere is probably the greatest gift that we can give to a child and to ourselves, that being in a space where you can find and foster passions and seek novel experiences, that's just, that's the heart of sort of being both successful in what you do, but also happy in what you do. And so we feel that this kind of work, continuing to sort of look at the student voice or the learner's voice is the other way to think about it, is that that's what's going to really um, bolster our, our ability to have education really be part of life. And just a reminder to everyone that learning really is everywhere. It's not happening just in schools or just at a CTY. It's sort of all around us. And when you can get in that mode of seeking these experiences, finding passions, fostering them, you can actually, you, know, you, can, you can acknowledge that the learning itself is something that is not a, a separate entity. It's part of what we do. And so with that, I'm going to pause and get advice from Stacy on moving on to questions. Amy, thank you so much. Uh, just fascinating research. I've been here at CTY for a long time and the stuff is still just so intriguing. Um, for the sake of time, let me go ahead and stop the recording and then we will get to some live Q&A.